at Winning by Design. Yeah, that's it. Originally from Israel. That's the only juicy part. Excellent. And I'm uh, Jeremy Spiker, based in uh, Amsterdam, and I'm an MD over uh, at, uh, at Winning here. And uh, for the next 60 minutes-ish, uh, Roe and, uh, and uh, to a certain degree myself will be taking you to optimizing sales uh, during a downturn. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Winning by Design, we are a, a management consulting and um, training and coaching firm uh, based in the Bay Area, California, US. Um, we, um, yeah, we focus on, on, on companies predominantly in the recurring, um, business model, uh, space. Um, and we spend a lot of our time and efforts in, uh, in R and D. And, um, and I think one of the trends or one of the, uh, the yeah, situations that, that, that are occurring at the moment, of course, is, is on a macroeconomic level. We see a lot of challenges that, uh, that impact us. Uh, luckily, they also impact our competitors and, and, and the whole market. Uh, so what we want to uh, do here today is, is give you an insight on um, how you could look at, um, at your own organization to identify opportunities to double down on, uh, on these uh, challenges that we're facing and actually turn them around and try to look at, at them as, as opportunities. Um, this is the first in a series of two webinars. Uh, so in a couple of weeks, we'll be having over James Bagan. He's the operating partner of, uh, or one of the operating partners over at Frog Capital in London, and uh, a VC that uh, is heavily investing right now in Europe. Um, and we're going to spend some time with him as well on, you know, what are the implications uh, for portfolio companies and, um, and what is he looking at, right, as an operating partner uh, when it comes to sustainability, predictability, et cetera. Uh, a link to, uh, to that webinar will also be in the uh, follow-up email from, uh, from this event. Um, we want to make it very interactive today. We have, um, um, uh, that's also why we chose uh, uh, Zoom over GoToWebinar. So if you guys want to come off mute with a question or if you have a question, uh, you don't feel comfortable coming off mute. Feel free to ask the question in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Roe will be focusing on uh, on some of the slides that we've prepared for you here today, but I'll monitor the chat and we'll uh, we'll interrupt uh, Roe if um, if a question is asked, and uh, and we'll try to answer as good as we can. Over to you, uh, Roe. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, can I ask for those of you who can please come on camera? Just makes it much more easier for me to see your faces and try to engage with you guys. Great. All look wonderful. Good. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be talking to you guys today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about optimizing sales during a downturn. Um, and we're going to try to make that as actionable, uh, as actionable as we can. And we're going to leave off with an actual plan that you guys can do tomorrow in order to drive that sustainable growth. Now, although downturn is not probably a great topic to focus on, it does have some fantastic elements to it, right? And these elements are key to understand. Cycles are normal and a downturn is a normal part of the cycles. And I'm hoping what you will get here is uh, today is to see the opportunities that we have during a downturn. Uh, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, just uh, want to, to uh, re-emphasize, um, feel free to uh, jump in. We're going to cover a lot of things today. I'm going to cover it fast. So if you need me to pause to uh, explain again, please uh, feel free to come off mute or write uh, to Jeremy in the chat. Yeah, and with no further ado, let's jump in. Um, this is, a, a, everybody knows uh, this guy, at least by name, right? Uh, Mark Anderson um, from uh, Anderson Horvitz, uh, San Francisco-based VC and an entrepreneur, a very successful one. And he, back in August of 2011, predicted that the future, every company will become a software company, right? And what he basically said is that every software is going to eat the world. And what we saw in the past 10, 10 years is that he was actually right, right? We saw that these are the number of unicorns each year. 2021, we had more than 300. That's only for July 2021. That We had 360 new unicorns appear in 2021. Um, and everything looked amazing. 
until this happens, right? Right? We were on a steady growth, COVID, all the, so most of the software companies, the SaaS uh, index really went skyrocketing. At some point, everything came crashing down. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So we like at Winnipeg Design to look at this as a learning moment, right? From transitioning from a scalable growth to a sustainable growth. And what we saw here is that a lot of companies had unsustainable growth. And we're going to talk about the difference, but basically scalable is grow at all cost, any and all cost. Um, but the markets are changing, right? It started from the public markets and it trickles down to the private markets and affects all of us and how we build and operationalize our companies. And that's what we're going to cover today. So what we prepared for you guys is two specific topics. The first one, we're gonna start off with the scientific, uh, with the science behind all of this, right? And historically, best practices in our world, sales, commercial, uh, go-to-market was shared through what we call operation on the sidewalk. People give each other advice based on their personal experience, their personal success or failures, right? That's valuable, of course, but it has its limits. Why? Because it's based on the data set of one or two, but that's usually it, right? It's not based on scientific principles. And this is where we, Winning by Design, come in and base uh, our learnings on scientific principles, and we're going to cover some of that today. The second part, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to leave you off with three recommendations on how to grow your sales during a downturn. Now, it's not the standard cut spending, fire 10% of your team, generate more leads kind of stuff. All very true, right? The fundamentals haven't changed. However, we're going to get much more uh, deeper there. And we're going to do a small exercise at the end of this uh, presentation. And we're going to, to talk about the fastest and most efficient way to double your revenue in the next 12 months. And yeah, I hope to intrigue you with what we prepared for you guys. Scientific uh, part uh, is divided into four different topics and we're going to start off with the S-curve and let's go back and understand what the S-curve means, right? Back in business school, we all learned, for the, those of you who attended business school, that growth is not indefinite, right? It has an end to it. And that end is the total addressable market. And the total addressable market is what we strive for, right? And of course, total addressable market can be increased, but for the sake of, of what we're talking today, let's say that it's capped um, our total addressable market. Um, and if we look at the axis, this is the uh, horizontal axis. This is the revenue, ARR, right? And this is uh, the horizontal axis is time. Um, and we, our growth is, is governed by the S-curve. Beginning, we gr grow slowly, right? And then we start to gain momentum. The angle gets steeper, and eventually it flattens out because we have less customers to approach, and the growth uh, declines over time. Now, um, let's focus on the top uh, right side of the, of the curve, uh, just to get the, the flow going and, and work the chat a bit. Can you guys give me, uh, right in the chat, companies that have reached their total addressable market? A few examples on the top of your head. Meta, that's right. IBM. My favorite example, guys, we can be more active here, but I'll help you guys. My, my uh, favorite example is, is Microsoft and the Office suit, right? PowerPoint, Excel. These are our products that have reached their total addressable market. Of course, we see here now Google uh, and in a bit Apple are trying to bite into that uh, market as well but that's basically uh, a market that has achieved the total adjustable market. The growth there is, you know, I don't know, I haven't checked, but it's probably anywhere between three to 5% growth year over year. Adobe. Adobe, can you elaborate? 
Well, I think uh, they reached their total uh, available market and therefore they bought um, maybe one of the reasons they bought uh, Figma to open up. Oh, all right. You're talking about that part of Adobe. Of course. Yeah, yeah. that's a good a good way to, to uh, uh, defend their total addressable market. All right, continuing on that. So uh, we, uh, growth, uh, the S-curve has three elements to it. The revenue, right, which is depicted by the ARR, the velocity, which is basically how much time it took us to get there, and the growth rate. The growth rate is the angle, the angle of attack, right? Um, and where you are depends on, on how, what's your ARR and how much time it took you to get here. We start to measure at one million dollar ARR because before that, well, basically you don't have enough uh, enough data. This is where we start tracking that curve, and where you are on the S curve determines something. Let's go into that in a few seconds. Now, in many cases, the outcome for us is an IPO. Right? There's an economic event. Most of us want to do an IPO or an exit of some sort, but let's focus on an IPO, for example. Um, and usually an IPO sits anywhere between seven to 15 years after the company started um, its existence, right? And the IPO usually happens between 100, 100 million to 350 million. Guys, I shit you not, I two weeks ago, I learned a company that did a SPAC, right? Went public through the back door with $4 million ARR. This is how crazy the markets were. Now there's a, a correction here. It's not, not no longer 100. Well, IPO has basically stopped, right? But it's going to increase back to the usual 150, 200, 250 million for an IPO. That's what we uh, generally see here. Can we all agree on those numbers, guys? Give me a thumbs up. Cool. And a company, when you grow, you go through different stages. And each stage, you're focusing on different things, right? Let's look at the, the, the stages as we define them at, at Winning by Design. Early stage company is where you are a startup. That's usually one to uh, $10 million ARR. A scale up is from that 10 million ARR. Um, all the way to that economic event, usually the IPO, a grown-up post-IPO where uh, your growth uh, starts to uh, trickle down, roughly like 10% year-on-year growth. And an enterprise is basically when we're looking at the, the Microsoft Oracle of the world, right? Their growth is like 5% a year. That's basically capped because, again, they reach that breach or reaching that total uh, addressable market. Right. Again, let's see, uh, guys. Please type in where you guys, where your companies are, which stage of this, to get a sense of uh, our audience today. Scale up, scale up. Nice startup. Oh, a lot of scale ups. Nice guys. All right, and of course, so you guys probably know this, right? The funding rounds, uh, uh, seed round, usually starts. Um, uh, you, here in Europe, it's like roughly 250K, uh, Series A, anywhere between five to 10 million. Some did pass that in Europe in uh, previously years. Of course, uh, US is much higher than that. B round, C round, D round, you get that, and IPO. Thumbs up, we're all good? Nothing good. Let's go a, leap, a, a little deeper, right? So. Up until now, uh, until the IPO, we talked about scalable growth. Scalable growth is basically I can grow just by uh, multiplying the, the, the things that I'm doing, adding more resources to it, right? And if you look at series A, if I found product market fit, I can scale by throwing more resources at it. This is scalable growth. It's a function of growth and velocity. Series A uh, companies, uh, Series A investors that they look into this uh, this area, this is what they're focused on, right? They're focused on, uh, um, have you achieved your product market fit? All right, are you ready to scale? Did you reach that $1 million ARR threshold? All right, let's pour money into what you're doing, start to scale, scale, scale. And historically, 
Uh, some refer to it as grow at all costs. And why is that grow at all costs? We know this, the hockey stick, and this is a, I'm assuming everybody in the call knows this graph, how much uh, time it took companies to achieve or reach that $100 million ARR. And it was all about that. Your, va your valuation is based on your growth rate, not what your cost structure was, right? But that has started, or before that has started. And what we saw is when a company reaches that IPO and becomes public, we start to look at cost. And that's where sustainable growth uh, comes into play. Sustainable growth, if we say that scalable growth is, grow, is growth as a function of velocity, sustainable growth is cost is a function of growth, cost, and velocity. So now we're starting to look at, um, at growth. Now, it usually took companies that went IPOs, they usually promised the investors, the public investors, uh, the public sector, hey guys, it will take us two years to reach profitability. That's like a rule of thumb, right? You go IPO and then you promise your investors, hey, I'm gonna reach uh, profitability, I'm gonna start generating profits in two years, right? That did not happen. We saw a lot of companies, a lot of SaaS companies that went public, but they were nowhere near becoming profitable. They still maintain the same principles as they had before. And this is why coming back to this graph that we showed before, this is why companies have gone down. When you think of it, Cisco, for example, went from $55 a share down to $45 a share, Microsoft 290 to uh, roughly 250, 240, right? But the SAS index, and we all heard those companies, right? 80%, 60% drop going from 250 to 50. And that's exactly the, re the reason, right? They are public companies. They are expected, they're expected to be profitable, but they're nowhere near going in that direction. And why is that? So let me ask you this. Um, we end before. Series C, so you guys are scale-up companies and you are uh, focusing on getting your Series C and you get that $20 million from an investor. What are you going to do with that money? Type it in or come off mute. Just close the Series C funding, $20 million. What will you hire? Thank you, Jeremy. Investing scaling, sales team, marketing spend. Sales and awareness. So it's all about sales, marketing, generating more leads, more funnel, more wins, right? But that's no longer uh, the case, right? Because when you're in C, you can spend on people, you can, uh, uh, your acquisition cost and your growth rate continues to go up. But what happens when the market slows, right? Or what happens after the IPO, right? You still hire the same people. Acquisition continues to go uh, up and the growth rate starts to go down because downturn, so less uh, leads. And you probably, we see it a lot with our clients that everything, the numbers are dropping and you probably are experiencing the same, right? So the public sector, uh, says you, know, hey, hey, uh, company. There's a lot of there's a lot of cost here, and your growth is slowing down. It does not make sense, right? You need to start generating profit, right? Thank you, Michael. We'll get back to that exactly. Customer success. Now, those public investors go back to the VCs and hey, look at what you sold me. It's a company. It's not reaching profitability. Now this is not fair what you sold us. So that's why we see the IPO have stall. And this is why we also see that the VCs, the, uh, the early, uh, the, the late stage VCs are also starting to think about sustainable growth, right? And how each company needs to find a way to focus on how to achieve that growth. Now, what it means to the most of us is that no more growth at all costs. And I'm saying most of us, right? Because there are still some companies that 
have amazing products and they can just scale and they can, can continue to pour money at it. But there's those are the exceptions. For most of the of the uh, companies, it's you know start to see how you do your cost spending. Questions on the first part. Got it. All right. Uh, so just to summarize in the first part, uh, we recognize that the uh, growth is governed by the S curve. We recognize that there are four different stages. Growth rate is a, uh, varies as a function of ARR and velocity. And we need to start thinking uh, of sustainable growth much earlier than we used to. Now let's see how those metrics uh, affect and change over the S curve. All right, so success uh, rate one of 100, you guys probably know these numbers, right? Uh, as entrepreneurs, you constantly look at this and you know you want to avoid being those companies that actually uh, fail and you want to continue to grow. And these are the numbers, right? If we look at this, this is probably like 100 companies for the sake of the examples, only one make it to that enterprise round, right? Question for the audience here and type in the chat. Uh, what's this? What's the first break point that you usually see in that startup mode? It's phase, sorry. Product market fit. You got it. Right? And that's the first one. And besides this obvious one, uh, at Winning by Design, we identify those uh, common break points and when they occur along that S curve. So you've got that uh, go-to-market fit. Once you uh, have established that product market fit, there are actually customers that are willing to buy your product. How do you scale that? And that's the go-to-market fit. How do you build your team around that a single process and are able to scale that? Then you start to look at churn. Like usually that happens. Uh, your first uh, cu customers start to churn, right? But what happens after? Can you maintain a significant amount of that? Can you deliver on your promises on what the product and the impact that your product can provide? The next uh, uh, break point is once you reach that roughly $10 million ARR in one go-to-market motion, you want to establish new go-to-market motions. What are the, the next ones that you can focus on? Net retention. Can we keep our customer long enough to be profitable on them on the long run? Interoperability, right? How do we combine all the different functions, processes, tools that our company, the different teams in our company uses? And productivity, you heard this probably a lot. Uh, productivity per rep, ARR per rep. This is where you look at this area. Now, These are different gate points that you need to, uh, that your organization has to pass. And one is built on top of the other. So you can't focus on churn before you uh, focus on go to market fit. You need to master this and you need to make sure that you uh, successfully found your go to market uh, fit before you start focusing on churn. Or to, 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 to emphasize, you can't be successful on churn without being successful on the previous breakpoint. Now, small comment here. Um, one of the challenges come with it is the changes of power and seniority at different uh, points along the S curve, right? So type in the chat, who is the key person of the company at this stage of the growth? Founder, of course, let's put the founder and CEO, right? He's always the most important guy, but the function within that company. Product, that's right. Right, the, the most important guy is the product guy. And then when we focus on uh, finding the go-to-market fit, scaling, who is the most important guy? Person, sales, right? We wanna scale, we wanna hire more salespeople. CCO, all right, CCO comes at a later stage, right? When you start, looking at commercial and CRO, that usually happens here when you start to look at the entire bow tie, a term that we'll come back to in a second. And out of curiosity, what happens here? Here's the most important person title in the company before you IPO. 
CRO, no. CFO, thank you, Andre. Right, CFO, he needs to make sure that everything works together, that uh, everything is uh, uh, financially uh, ready for the IPO. And what happens, right? Of course, not to Michael, that's a good point, right? You don't want to hire uh, those people, those executives too early in the, in the process. Now, coming back to the problems that we have, a shift of focus, a shift of uh, power balance, right? Usually uh, a company grew, it took them 40 years to achieve that IPO. And nowadays when we're talking about SAS, it takes, as we said, seven to 15 years, most commonly seven to 10 years. Right, and you can imagine the balance of power that needs to happen every two week, every two years, and that's something very difficult for a company to do. And we see that uh, when we work with the clients, right? We see that all the time. That hey, VP of Sales, that's good, but we need to start focusing on customer success right now. So let's see how we design for sustainability, right? I'll, uh, we at Reading by Design mapped out different focuses along the journey. So uh, you got that. Uh, the first one is to understand the revenue model. Are we going to, uh, what's our pricing model? Monthly, yearly, uh, usage-based, seed-based, et cetera. You, get, you focus on that in the uh, early, uh, early stages of the company. Founder-led sales, right? You don't hire VP of sales right away. You have the founders do the sales. In, in uh, incorporate the data model. We'll get back to that, what exactly that means, but you need to start tracking uh, data across the entire bow tie. You need to establish your go-to-market strategy. How uh, are you going to the market? Which uh, positions do you need uh, to hire to the company? You want to establish that repeatable process. You want to establish a growth formula. We'll get back and describe the growth formula. And then you, you need to start talking about scalability what makes sense to scale, net revenue retention, how much ARR lifetime value I can increase for my existing clients, and sustainability, which is the next phases of our discussion here. A different point here, you focus on different metrics, right? At the, in the beginning, you look at deal metrics, right? The number of customers, your ACV, the discount, number of uh, spend for each customer, when you look at more of the early stage growth, right? You look at pipeline value, it's all about closing more deals. So it's all about revenue, MRR, ARR, these kinds of metrics. When you look at uh, revenue growth rate, which you become a startup around that 10 million, you start to look at churn, you start to look at the growth formula, you start to look at velocity um, and sales performance of the entire team. And when you reach those places, it's basically CAC, call to, CAC to LTV ratio, the payback period, um, revenue expansion, et cetera. Um, sustainability is where we focus on cost of the go-to-market motions, gross margin, cost to serve, free cash flow. This is where you start to focus on these metrics. Any questions on the second stage? Thumbs up, all good? Still got you guys engaged? Perfect. All right, so we talked about a series of breakpoints along the growth metrics, and we also talked about the different focuses that you have during that growth. Let's look at the data model, right? How we actually look at the data. This is the uh, half part of the data model, and historically, you only looked at the left side of the data model, right, of the bow tie, sales and marketing funnel. Right, lead gen, lead development, and sales. This is basically uh, the fun, right? The but this approach is outdated. It's based on you know the time of perpetual hardware and software, where you uh, get your buy your customer to buy, and then like you don't care what happens after that. Sus uh, in our business in our sector things have changed, right? Because recurring revenue is a result of recurring impact. If the client does not have or gain that impact, a recurring impact, he will no longer be with us. So we need to start looking at the entire bow tie, the left side and the right tie. And that's basically the problem that we have with 
the classical sales and marketing funnel. They only look at this part, right? And when you only look at this part, you are, you have that deal mentality, they're win, 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 uh, 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 and you don't look at customer success or what, ha what happens after uh, the client commits or you both commit to doing business together. Now, any, uh, any CS guys here? Raise your hand. All right, good. Um, metrics model. Uh, this is uh, the full bow tie from left to right customer journey. Uh, prospects on the left side becomes a, a excited and expanding uh, customer on the right side. These are the different stages. Uh, won't go into that. This is how we apply the metrics at Winning by Design. And each go to market uses different terminology, right? This is a two-stage motion uh, with means SDR and AE. You start off with the prospect, MQL, SQL, win rate, active, live, MRR, LTV. This is, again, two-stage motion, SDR, AE. That's the terminology that we use here for the sake of the example, right? If you don't have this kind of model, this is one of the first thing I advise for you guys to do tomorrow. Make sure that you look at the entire bow tie and you have the entire company speak the same language, the same terminology, and looking at the entire bow tie from left to right. All right, that was uh, the easy part. Now it's going to be a bit more complicated, just a bit, right? There, we're going to talk about numbers and math. Um, but it's super important. So listen up here. Uh, and what we do with that data, and this is what we're we're going to cover on the growth formula. So just put it, um, simply uh, putting it up here. This is uh, simpler uh, than it looks, right? Uh, on the left side, uh, let me move to the right. So on the, uh, on the left side, uh, you start off with MQLs that turn into SQL. CR2 is the conversion metrics. The conversion rate metric between an SQL to an opportunity, that's CR3. The win rate, commit, discount, and new ARR. Let's plug the numbers into the growth formula, and this is how it looks like, right? I start off 114 MQLs with a conversion rate of 3.2, convert uh, or equal to 3.7 SQLs. With a conversion rate of uh, 80, uh, 84.5 percentage, that brings me to three opportunities. Three opportunities. Win rate of 32%, that's one commit, normalized to one deal. Average discount is 23%, is equivalent to new ARR of $18,408. Benchmark, this is a standard, this is one of the, our clients, this is not a benchmark. This is just an example, right? Thanks, Aaron. So this is, again, how much MQLs I need to generate one win, which is equivalent to 18K. But these are not static numbers, right? When we look at win rate, win rate changes over time. Let me move down here so you see here the numbers this is the different win rates broken down to different sectors right on um, and you see them quarter by quarter and you see here that the numbers drop same thing goes for the cr2 which is mqls to sql and you can see that they drop over time let's look at the right side of the bow tie right we said that this is important also to look there Right, first year, our retention rate 98, opposite of churn, right? Expansion 100, this is the ARR year two. I do the same math and lifetime value of five years brings us to a total of uh, $111,000, right? We started off with a first year of 18K, turned into uh, 111. Guys, this is fantastic, this is scalable, right? There's a good expansion rate here. These are good numbers. However, if I were to tell you 
that it cost me 50,000 to generate one lead. I take all this uh, sales and marketing spend on the right and the left side of the bow tie, this side, and I divide it by the lifetime value of five years. Oh, sorry. I, I, I divide it by the number of clients. I get to 15K. It takes it, I need to pay 15K to my sales and marketing team to generate lifetime value of 111. Is this good or bad? In the chat. All right, bad. Why is that? Aaron, too expensive, right? Too expensive if you look at the rule of thumb, right? The LTV, CAC to LTV ratio, VCs are looking for one to three. That's the average and right, 40 to 111. That's too expensive. That's not sustainable. This is how we use the growth formula to start to balance that, uh, to balance our costs. And you can start analyzing if I'm too expensive, am I spending too much, or am I doing it well? This is the first part, the scientific part. Uh, we talked about the growth, uh, the S-curve, the growth metrics, uh, insights on, on the data, and the growth formula. Any questions? All right, let's see how we put that into action, right? So under the current situation, sorry, any questions? Under the current situation, downturn, and if I was under the current model that I presented to you, how would you, um, how would we double the revenue in the next 12 months? Let's see how we do that. Right, so this is our goal, right? To double the revenue um, and we make that a priority, right? It's important to realize it's always growth, it's always uh, comes at a cost of other things, right? If um, I'm taking um, VC money, it comes at a cost that I'm giving away uh, shares of my company, right? And I bring in more money, I can hire more people, I can focus on tools and, and, and improving the processes. It comes on the expense of, giving away parts of the of, of my company. So what ways did we have in order to continue to grow or to reach that uh, 2x year on year growth? Please write in the in the chat. Guys, you all are aware and know this. How can I increase my revenue? How can I increase my revenue or double my revenue in 12 months? More leads, better conversion, that's two. I'm looking for the third one, improve CR. That's like the second one, upsell cross-sec on product, right? And that's basically what we have as, as revenue operators, revenue executives, right? I can bring in more leads, I can improve win rates, conversion rate, and I can uh, uh, focus more on expansion. Uh, Gerg, uh, yeah, high RCV is also one thing, but it's a one-time thing. Happy to uh, um, shed more light, but it's a one-time thing that you, you can do there, and it's usually effective to a certain extent. But these are the three things that we can focus on. Let's see each one of them. Bring in more leads. Hey, it's, it's, it's complicated, right? If it wasn't complicated, you guys have done that already. Right, even in downturn, generating the same number of leads is also very complicated um, and complex. There, it takes quarter to implement. Right, if you implement an SEO campaign, if you bring start open an event, it takes you quarters to achieve that that uh, increase in leads. Right, and it's expensive. Bringing more leads, it's expensive, and you know what? The quality, the more leads you bring in, the quality drops. So it's not even sure that you'll achieve that double revenue. You can improve the win rate, right? Uh, or, or conversion rates, um, but it's challenging because you need to deal with people and you need to train and you need to change the habits of your team. You have quick results uh, relatively fast, right? And we'll see a bunch of those. And you, uh, it's relatively low cost to do, right? Bring in a trainer, focus more on coaching, 
uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's another option. And more expansion, right? Expansion, first of all, it has to come with something. You need to bring in more features, et cetera, but you need to reorg and hire the CS team. You need to train them. There are long and quick hits, quick hits, uh, right? It's increasing your ACV or pricing point, uh, but it's expensive because you need to hire more people and you need to train them. So it's an expensive part. And I'm not even talking about developing new features uh, of your product. Let's focus on this, improving win rate, right? It's usually the quickest and easiest out of the three. Let's look at example, right? We're going back to the same uh, numbers as before. Let's look at the discount rate. We love to give discounts. The companies that we work with love to give discounts. This is one of the first thing that we tell them, stop giving discounts. Or if you can't stop, at least lower the discount rate that you're giving. And the biggest mistake here is that we as salespeople think I don't know, we all think like that, that there's a linear collect connection between discount and win rate, as if we're selling somebody a television, right? It's not that, companies do not act the same way, right? There's no, there's no real connection between a discount and a win rate, because SaaS is, bought, is not bought on budget, it's bought on priority. I will repeat that because that's very, very important. SaaS is not bought on budget, it's bought on priority. So there's no real connection between a discount and a win rate. And if you do the, the, the numbers, and we did, and we, and we did this, and we looked at different cases uh, from our clients and different reps, the ones that gave a lot of discount, their win rate increased by a fraction. The one that uh, did not, that's the win rate. So there's no one-on-one -on -one linear relationship between discount and win rate. And from going from 30% discount to uh, lowering it to 50%, that's a 12% increase in ARR, which is a lot, guys. When you compound it all together, it's a lot. Now, how do you do that, right? It's a discount policy, but different than what we're, we were trained, we were all trained to do, right? It's not, um, you know, um, if you want to give it a 5% discount, you can do it. 10% go to your team manager, 20% uh, go to the, the CRO. It's not like that, right? And it's focusing on building a, a discount policy that is based on trading. You want a 3% discount? you need to pay everything up front. You want a 5% discount, let's sign a multi-year contract. And if you I'll give away a 3% discount, if you execute the contract by date, right? And by the way, guys, small tip here, the, the date is not the end of the quarter. It's not the, the, the 22nd of December. It's two weeks before that because we all experience what happens if they send us the, the, the signed PO on the 26th, uh, 22nd of December, right? It's the 1st of December. And if you introduce us to industry peers, that will give you another 5%. And all these, right, affect or improve our company. This uh, improves uh, DSO, they pay quicker, improves our retention, our focus, our lead gen. This is what we talk trade. You get something in return to that discount and you're not just giving away of the hopes that they will close. How do you do that? Let's go with uh, uh, deeper, right? Turn by turn uh, directions. We at Winning by Design believe in visuals. When, when I was uh, uh, learning to be an account executive, I used to get like those big playbooks with a lot of text and do this and this. Nowadays, we all like to see processes in visuals and it can be much more complicated, right? How do you manage a deal? You open, you set the agenda, you plan on what needs to happen, you qualify, you define the needs and the impact, and then you propose and trade, et cetera. And each step can be much uh, more detailed there. Let's look at another example, right? Back to the win rate. 
<clears throat> we like to think it was win rate as wins divided by opportunities or wins divided by close one and plus close lost, right? That's that's the win rate. But when you think of it, win rate is uh, comprised of different activities. Let's take, for example, AE that needs to ha have, needs to conduct five meetings in order to close a deal. That's our sales process, right? Discovery, demo, uh, negotiation, trade, five different meetings along that sales process. We can look at the different conversion rate of each meeting, right? And let's, if, in, and if we can improve the percentage here of each meeting, we can affect and increase our win rate. So again, let's look at the math. 80% moving on to the next meeting, five meetings, that 32% win rate. If I just do small improvements here and I increase each meeting by 2%, that has a huge effect. So going from 32 to 37, percent win rate. That's small improvements that we have there. That's almost 15% improvement of the win rate. How do we do that? Yeah, uh, achieve mastery level at everything that your reps are doing, right? It's not doing a discovery call and succeeding one and then doing it. You need to master and do it exactly or, or and you pitch perfect each discovery call. Uh, demonstration pitch needs to be excellent. Discuss the process, decision criteria, how to provoke, how to do multi-thread kind of sales. Priority based on decisions, right? And stakeholder meetings when we're selling to enterprises. All this we need to do, you, we need to have our reps do very, very well. And this all comes back to managing the deal. Again, this is how the blueprint of managing a deal looks like identify conversation, how do you do demo, how do you provoke, provocative, if you're choosing that path, provocative is when we do, when um, the client doesn't know he has a problem, consultative, when our client needs help making the decision, right, whether to go with us or with the competition, um, or to navigate through the entire uh, organization. These are the different uh, uh, detailed explanation of each one, and also what needs to happen when it's how do you disqualify and how do you disqualify fast? What happens if the client goes dark? What happens if it's a lost opportunity? What do you do at each stage to increase that small improvement along the sales process? So these are the two actions that we talked about. Let's combine them together. 15% improvement on the win rate, 26% on the discount, putting it all together. Sorry, it's forgot the number there, but together that's 27% improvement on the win rate. Just by doing those, focusing on those small improvements. Now do that on the rest of the conversion metrics, on the SDRs, on, on, on the marketing, on in, improve, in, increasing your ARR, and you will get to double your revenue. So when, they, when we have the state of the economy and you have to do more with what you have, this is the best, quickest way to do it. And the, the good thing is we came from a good economy. That means that we have a lot of fat that we can uh, um, carve out, right? There's a lot of improvements that we can do internally and with our uh, teams in order to prove that. All right, guys, uh, five, Two more minutes and then we'll uh, open for discussions. Five action plans that you can do tomorrow. Growth model, make sure that you know where you are in the growth on the S-curve. What do you need to focus on? And have you mastered the previous breakpoints? Have you overcome those breakpoints and ready to take on the next focus? Unified data model, you'd be amazed. Jeremy and I just got off a phone yesterday with a client, Fortune 500 company, they don't have data. Like Jeremy and I were, were thinking, what can we do in order to, to help this client if we don't have data? You guys need to have the data to make those uh, insightful decisions. Make sure that you have the data and look at the entire bow tie, not only sales and marketing, but also what happens after they become our clients. Focus on the growth formula, right? That's your 
uh, operating model for the entire organization. How much efforts, what's the cost of generating one win? What's the cost of, uh, what's our lifetime value across five years? And find those conversion rates, the conversion metrics that you can focus on. In, uh, one of them, for example, is lowering the discount that you give your clients, increasing the win rate, and that's how you double your revenue. We focused on the science and the math calculations behind that, and we ended up with different recommendations and things to focus on. And with that, I would leave you with this quote. Thank you very much. And you know, I'll, we have five more minutes for questions, and I also can stay a bit longer if anybody else has additional questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rawe. For those, uh, for those interested, we will be doing a, a session with James Bagan, as mentioned at the beginning of the call. So I will be uh, sending over a recap email of, um, of, of today, including the recording, and also a link to the webinar registration for the uh, session with James, uh, which most likely will be on November 5th. Um, and just want to uh, thank uh, thank Roe. Um, and you know, I was I was at uh, a, a um, Notion Capital event on Monday. Uh, Notion invites all their uh, portfolio executives um, uh, once a year over a beautiful resort in uh, in London. And um, one of the things that really stood out there for me was the the way that they were talking about sustainability, right? Um, they were they were even saying right that historically we would only invest in companies that showed crazy growth trajectories. But you know the re reality of the matter is that we cannot expect that anymore. Um, meaning that and and their partners were sitting there conveying this message. If we find a company that can show us that they the way that they're growing is sustainable, is predictable, uh, and is close to being profitable. Um, but their growth trajectory only shows an, an, an annual growth of 40, 50, 60%. That's also very interesting for us. That's also the kind of companies that we would consider investing in, in the current uh, uh, climate, right? So I think all of this is becoming increasingly important over the next months, years. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that also stood out for me at that event is that this climate is probably going to take 12 months, 18 months, maybe even, right? So for most of us, this is going to impact our fundraising in the future. So, you know, thinking about um, uh, increasing the insights on, you know, how do we get sustainable? How do we get profitable? When uh, is going to be important for you guys when you go out there and and and, and fundraise? So I see there's a question uh, from uh, from Bjork. Um, so I think this one is for you, uh, Roy. What are indicators of product market fit versus go to market fit? It's not an easy one. Do you want to take this one? I see you're coughing. No problem. Product market fit is when you have customers that are willing to buy your product, right? It's not one, it's, it's not two, but you need to have a sust substantial number of clients, customers that are buying your product. That's product market fit. And they're actually using it, of course, right? It's not only to sell, but they're actually using it. Rule of thumb. Right, uh, for VCs is one million dollar ARR, and if you're doing a PLG, it's uh, I don't remember the the number for PLG what, but the number of users I want to say a thousand, but I'm not sure. So that's product market fit. Go to market fit, that it, it that you start to recognize a recurring or a repeatable process, right? A repeatable process that. The, the 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 actual uh win rate is is kind of steady or but that's steady the different people can sell it not only the founders so you had you were able to teach your sales rep to actually sell other people can sell what your your product acv usually starts to narrow down so you start to have like a, a, a it's not all over the all over the place for example, one client buys 60K, another customer buys the 10K, right? You start to see a level down average around a, a certain uh, number. So that's usually the different uh, definitions. 
And once you have that and you start to see a repeatable product, you just bring in more people and they just do the same. Any other questions? All right. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining. Yeah. And see you November 4 or 5? 5th, Jeremy. 5th, November 5th. 5th. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.